Senate file 2466 before the <laughs> Chair, may I proceed? Please go ahead and tell us about the bill. Members, uh, before you is uh, Senate file 2466. Uh, this bill has to do with uh, raising the threshold uh, of search on any electronic device surveillance um, that is done by government. Um, as many of you know, uh, technology, uh, technological capabilities of surveillance is expanding uh, at a rapid pace, almost exponentially, and um, in keeping with uh, sort of being consistent with sort of the common notions of the Fourth Amendment and common civil protections for individuals. Uh, I think it's important that we also update the statutes uh, to reflect uh, sort of those current technological capabilities that were conceived of um, maybe prior to those uh, uh, developments. So um, I won't uh, spend a ton more time talking about the philosophy behind the bill. I'll do a quick run through of the various sections and then uh, let us get to the testimony. So um, first, so Mr. Chair, I have an amendment. Yeah, we have an author's amendment. Looks like it will read everything. Uh, this is the first committee uh, for this bill. So uh, Senator Dietzik moves the A3 amendment as an author's amendment. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, motion prevails, amendments adopted. Senator Dietzik. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is, uh, this is an amendment uh, that some of the changes uh, that the House Committee um, had worked through um, some of the input from uh, the law enforcement community and, and otherwise. Um, so walking through the A3 amendment, uh, members you'll see first uh, on the first page, uh, line 1.21, uh, that section simply says that uh, subdivision 3 and uh, all of the conditions there um, still exist, uh, but for uh, the subject of the bill, 626A.2, um, there are uh, the requirements therein, which is the rest of the bill. Section 2 is the definitions that are uh, simply used uh, in the language of the body of the bill. Subdivision 2 is the search warrant requirement uh, specifics in general. Um, subdivision 3 is uh, the time period or, um, that the search warrant uh, is valid for subdivision four is the notice that is provided to the subject of the warrant. And subdivision five is uh, reporting back to the legislature um, the, the instances of uh, the use of this authority. Subdivision six is um, saying that where, uh, essentially where these um, uh, requirements are not met uh, according to the standards of 626, that, that uh, those items will not be in evidence. Um, that is a quick run through of the subdivision of the bill. I'll, Mr. Chair, if you want to move the testimony, uh, we can do that or I can stand for questions. Well, will your testimony give us a little more detail about what the bill is? <coughs> sure. Um, or you can do that. Uh, I can do that. Do you have any uh, scope for review of it? Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, no problem. Uh, so members, um, currently, uh, under current law, um, location data can be uh, derived uh, by uh, government entities uh, with uh, uh, tools or, or methods um, that are less than um, a probable cause standard uh, or search warrant standard. Um, uh, law enforcement right now is, is going about um, getting location, location data uh, through electronic device um, by a court order, um, which is a reasonable, reasonable sus suspicion standard versus probable cause. Um, this bill would require that um, where we're doing individualized specific surveillance, um, that you would need to have a warrant present uh, in order to do, uh, or a warrant obtained in order to do that uh, surveillance. Um, the, the bill also outlines the timeline or the, the 
time uh, that these warrants can be authorized up to <coughs> 60 days. You see that in uh, subdivision three. Uh, subdivision four um, outlines the notice that must be provided um, to, the, to the subject of the search warrant. Um, it's worth pointing out that um, these uh, timelines can be extended. Um, the law enforcement entity simply has to go back to the judge and get, uh, get the notification or the uh, uh, warrant itself extended. Um, another change that was made in the second engrossment of the house, which just represents um, the original uh, language of the bill had a felony level requirement for use uh, of these methods. We make, uh, we actually make an exception also for um, domestic abuse or domestic violence related offenses. Um, so uh, in those instances, you don't have to reach the felony uh, threshold. Um, also, um, stalking is included in that. Uh, so that's Senator Peterson's back up a second. Yeah. Um, that Provision is in subdivision two on page two. That is in subdivision two. Yes. So lines 13 and 19, specifically on line 18, and 19 it provides uh, that the warrant may be used. When the person who possesses that device is committing, has committed, or is about to commit a felony level offense or a qualified domestic violence group. Really yeah. So are those the only circumstances under which this bill authorizes uh, the, uh, the, this mechanism of surveillance? Yes, um, with the, um, also uh, with the exception of, uh, if you go to uh, page one, um, there are also certain uh, emergency uh, authorization capabilities that you can see there. Uh, listing of those clause one through five. Um, that applies to felony level offenses, but also any immediate um, concerns about uh, severe injury or death, uh, safety, um, kidnapping or, or missing persons, um, emergencies, things of that nature. So we provide for emergency authorization for law enforcement to, to go evaluate uh, the, the things they need to do situations utilizing every every uh, bit of technology that they have at their disposal to do so. So where is the adverse result language used in the, in the substantive part of the bill? You're talking about outside of the, the definitions section. Right. Consent 
of the only order we regard as next of kin. Clause 5, the murder of state law may be dictated without serious reason. So, under no circumstances, if there's a suspected misdemeanor that's not a domestic violence related offense, can that location data be obtained? Yes. The court can't even grant the warrant under those circumstances. Right? That's correct. And then there's, in subdivision three, there's a, when a warrant is granted, the warrant is only good for 60 days unless it's extended pursuant to specific authorization. Yes, Mr. Chair, and that's just to prevent sort of a, a blanket authorization that's ongoing forever, 60 day requirement allows it uh, for most, covers most instances, and it doesn't even prevent the reauthorization. So they can go back to the judge and get another up to 60 day authorization. Okay, we're not talking about obtaining historic data, right? This is just contemporary collection of location data, is that right? Yes, contemporary. Uh, I'm seeing a reference in the bill to contemporaneous collection as it relates to uh, the time period. <coughs> but is, is there a limitation uh, somewhere else in the definitions or somewhere that says if you, uh, you don't, if it's, it's only applies to contemporaneous location data? It's uh, uh, historical data and, and contemporaneous. So if, if law enforcement is conducting an investigation of a misdemeanor offense and they want to get cell phone location data, they can't, not even with a warrant. Historical data? Yes, that's, yes. Okay, let me, let me just posit a question for you because I happen to be familiar with one of situation a person is charged with theft. So a misdemeanor level theft because the value of the product is below the felony threshold. And in order to figure out if it was the theft was a cell phone. And so if law enforcement is investigating uh, the theft of that cell phone, they might be able to theoretically they could get historic location data if that cell phone was used by the person who allegedly stole it. Yeah. And they might be able to track that cell phone right back to that person's house, for example, um, or their route of commute from their place of work or something like that. So if the cell phone was stolen? That yes. Um, that would fall within an exception for the time device reported lost or stolen by the owner? So you'd be able to use that authority under the, under the first clause or something. And what if the uh, police suspected that a person had stolen something else and they weren't sure if that person had done it, but they wanted to follow up the investigation? They wouldn't be able to get contemporaneous data or historic data if it was a misdemeanor level theft? Say, I, I think Joe Smith stole a TV. I tell the police that. I think Joe Smith went off in that direction. Yeah. The police can't go get a warrant to uh, to, to, to Joe Smith's cell phone information and try to follow Joe Smith that way. Um, actually, we have some. Do you have Joe Smith here to test him? And his cell phone. But uh, just trying to figure out the parameters. Well, the answer is no, um, uh, Mr. Chair. No. The, the, Go ahead, state your name, please. Uh, this is, my name is Chuck Sammons, and I'm the executive director of the ACLU. Um, under the present bill as amended, um, the answer is no. They can't get a search warrant for this other than for an electronic device or the things that are called out. For neither historic nor contemporary. I haven't been approached by anyone that has indicated that that is a 
found in practice than uh, individuals are out seeking warrants for misdemeanors or petty misdemeanors in the main location. Um, certainly uh, something to consider. But under the current bill, it's, it's Sorry, can you pull the mic closer so we can make sure everyone uh, in here? Uh, okay, so I think I'm getting a better sense of how the bill's hanging together. Uh, and then the notice provisions. So how does that work? <coughs> So um, every the general impetus is that every person who is the subject of the warrant will be notified at some point um, without uh, continuous capability of uh, law enforcement to be able uh, to delay uh, that. Uh, the notice provision, um, as you um, see here, unless the delay notice is ordered under paragraph C, which would most likely um, work alongside the length of authorization that the judge provided in the initial <coughs> um, Once that delayed notice provision, which again would most likely coincide the length of the initial warrant, uh, it must be done within three days of obtaining um, the information or three days after the uh, implementation of the initial delay. So, Police are investigating a crime, they want to go get a warrant, the warrant's good for 60 days. No delay is authorized, so they immediately send out a notice to the owner of the cell phone? Well, the, they would not be, the delay would, would be ordered at, at the same time that the length of the search warrant authority, um, since the same decision making authority is going to make the decision on both of those things. Well, let's say they're not, they don't seek or they're not granted a delay. Then they have to send out a notice right away that they obtain the search warrant? We can that would be, yeah, yeah, yes, uh, in that hypothetical situation, uh, that would be the case. Although, I think in the instance where a judge grants you a uh, 30-day capability to, um, uh, to do this sort of surveillance, um, uh, I'm not certain they would allow, uh, they would just do the 30 day of delay to coincide um, the warrant authority. But so you're anticipating then that the judge would probably grant a delayed notice for a time period that would correspond with the length of the warrant. So really, it's but it's not necessary for the judge to do that. I guess we assume that if a delay was, we assume that if a delay was, uh, was uh, wanted, it would be applied for. And we also assume, perhaps incorrectly, that if a judge were to issue a warrant and that if the delay was requested, that the delay would be granted. Yeah, I think, Mr. Chair, uh, that's certainly, so, thank you, Mr. Chair, I think that's certainly something that could be clarified and, and written into statute. I think we um, sort of inherently in subdivision three are granting some of some leeway within the 60-day guideline. We're not telling them exactly what it needs to be, and we sort of grant them the same authority to determine the manner in which they delay alongside that 60-day window. So um, it would be logical, but we could be more straightforward. We could we could codify that requirement certainly. So that's uh, that's essentially the notice provision. So Senator Peterson, I just want to make sure that I'm clear. So so it's my understanding uh, um, if law enforcement goes in, they request a search warrant in order to get get someone's uh, location information, right? And um, at that time, if I'm reading this bill correctly. The judge can can grant that search warrant and also make a decision about the notice requirement. If if the court uh, if the law enforcement officer doesn't give any compelling reasons, you know uh, that would that would be considered the adverse result 
then then the the, the the officer may potentially get the search the search warrant and they have to provide notice I think under this bill within three days after they get the electronic information is that right yes Senator James Bean. so uh, at the same time the law enforcement uh, entity is going to be in front of the judge requesting you know they're, they're they're not always going to be requesting 60 days necessarily they could be requesting 15 days um, at that very at that same time um, they would also make a request to obviously not notify the individual until the duration of that authorization is up and then three days at, at the end of at the end of that uh, uh, timeline uh, they would be required to notify mr chair just a follow chance and it's my understanding as it pertains to the bill is that if if they're granted that delay, then that delay cannot exceed 90 days, but still has to be three days after whatever the delay period that the court grants them. And, and there has to be articul articulated reasons as to why this delay should be granted, which is where you get to page one of your bill, or the bill, and it talks about the adverse results. So, so the law enforcement officer would have to say, well, Your Honor, the reason why we don't want to let the person know right away because they might, uh, 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 they might run from from prosecution, right? Or or they might do something, uh, but it would have to be one of the adverse uh, reasons articulated in Section Two of the bill. Is that right? Yes. Yes. I just want to make sure that I was quick in tracking that. And then uh, Senator Peterson subdivision. Five provides for the judge who issues or denies a warrant to, to report annually on each warrant. Then yes. It's it's the through the court administrator, yes. And the court administrator aggregates the data and sends it to the legislature. Is that the idea? Yeah, we give the legislature the idea of the amount of times that this authority is being used. And publishes that data on the website as well. Yes, yeah, that's in paragraph C. And then subdivision six says if you get your data in violation of this law, you need a warrant, you need a lot of exception of that requirement, you can't use it. Yes. And then if you want to use it, you've got to get you've got to turn over the copy of the warrant. And its application is 10 days before it's going to be used unless the judge makes an exception. Yes, Mr. Chair, that, um, that section may be somewhat duplicative, but that may already be the case given the, uh, the other language of the statute. But um, yes, that's the judge's term. Okay. So, are uh, there any members that may have any questions about how the bill is supposed to work? All right, why don't we hear from those who have uh, identified they want to testify. Um, see, Mr. Neumeister, you've already approached. Did you have something to add specifically to what we've already talked about? You're on a testimony list. Yeah. I just wanted to add what you were in some discussion about yes. uh, information. In regards to the notice, for the record. Mr. Chairman, for the record, my name is Rich Neumeister. In regards to the notice provisions, law enforcement is currently doing that under 626A, whether <coughs> there's a delayed notice, 90 days, all those things, that's basically what the same language is in subdivision four. That's been done for 25 years. The 626-20A provision is being amended here. It's the section of law that allows government entities to get hold of non-content records by electronic communication service companies, which means such things people as Verizon, Google, and all those kinds of things. So you know, that's what we're dealing with, it's non-content records, basically, but we're just sort of focusing on location data. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Uh, Mr. Samuelson, you're the first on the uh, testifier list. Why don't you go ahead? Thank you, uh, Chairman. You want my name and everything again? I thought you already stated that. We're good. Okay, thank you. Uh, the ACLU of Minnesota supports Senate File 2466. 
because the bill updates Minnesota privacy law to reflect the modern mobile world by providing needed protection against warrantless government access to a person's cell phone location information. Today, more than ever, Minnesotans are both aware of powerful new surveillance technologies available to law enforcement agencies, and they're concerned about how these technologies are being used. Just last month, the Star Tribune conducted a poll that found that 63% of those surveyed were somewhat or very concerned about the amount of personal information that the state of Minnesota and law enforcement collects on individuals. Most Minnesotans now own and carry cell phones. With assistance from cell phone carriers or through its own cellular tracking devices, the government has the technical capability to track any cell phone owner 24 hours a day for as long as it takes. They like it. <coughs> cell phones can be tracked in real time, and all cell phone companies keep historical records on where cell phones have been in the past, going back months or even years. Such extensive and precise monitoring from its government agencies to construct an incredibly detailed portrait of an individual's life, their associations and activities, far beyond what would ordinarily be possible through mere observation. To be clear, the ACLU of Minnesota is not opposed to the use of new surveillance technologies such as cell phone location tracking and policing. The work of our law enforcement agents is important and we all have an interest in it being done effectively. However, we believe that safety should not come at the expense of civil liberties. The bill safeguards privacy rights and makes necessary updates to Minnesota law to protect sensitive location information consistent with our constitutional rights and values. Most importantly, Senate Files 2466 requires a government entity to obtain a search warrant based on probable cause before obtaining the location information of a cell phone or other electronic devices. This approach is consistent with traditional Fourth Amendment protections. At least two state Supreme Courts, Massachusetts and New Jersey, have required a warrant to obtain cell phone location information, and it's possible that the Minnesota Supreme Court will do the same in the future. Imposing a warrant requirement in statute will protect criminal convictions from being overturned should that happen. Southern File 24 66 further provides necessary transparency and oversight regarding government access to location information by instituting reporting requirements and requiring that notice be given to the owner or user of a cell phone or other electronic device whose location information was obtained. Two states, Maine and Montana, have already enacted laws to address location tracking, and at least four others, including Utah, New Hampshire, South Carolina, and Maryland, have similar legislation pending. We believe that in Minnesota, with balanced legislation, we can preserve the legitimate uses of this tool for law enforcement without sacrificing our core right to be free from unreasonable government scrutiny. Accordingly, we respectfully urge this committee to support it. Senate File 2466. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Samus, can you help me understand why um, the warrant report, why it would be limited to felony and domestic violence related cases? If, there's a, if the warrant threshold is the criteria, uh, why uh, limit it to those cases and not also allow it to investigate this? Well, in, there's, a, there's a couple of reasons. The, the, first, the first one is that the bill as amended um, eliminated the all crimes and substituted the felony and, and, um, and domestic violence. The second is that many misdemeanors, and this may be paranoia, long-standing nature. But many petty misdemeanors and misdemeanors um, are, are, are given to people who are engaged in political activity and associational, First Amendment associational activity. Particularly historical data can be used to track who you've hung around with going back for probably 18 months, which is going probably going to be the new federal standard. So that the cell phone companies will collect data and hold it for 18 months can be used um, in government searches. So the assumption is that we could be able to track your cell phone and where you've been and who you've been with for up to 18 months prior. And we think that that, we, we feel, the ACLU feels, that that possibly could be a significant privacy problem. Senator Peters. Uh, yeah, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, I really have no problem uh, 
expanding the scope of that to include any crime, uh, quite frankly, if that's the will of the committee. Uh, this was language that uh, was uh, worked on with the, our House colleagues as well as other stakeholders, um, but certainly it's not a it's not a deal breaker by any stretch of the imagination that the committee <coughs> Any questions by the committee for Mr. Samuelson? <laughs> uh, Mr. Meister, since you're already there, you can go ahead with your job. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, for the record, my name is Rich Meister. I'm very proud to support 2466. One of the things that the last time that the Minnesota legislature looked at this law was 25 years plus ago. And a lot of things have changed. Smartphones, GPS location are things that were never dreamed of when your predecessors sit at this same room discussing those kinds of issues. And so what this bill is, is to attempt to bring Fourth Amendment protections on very sensitive location kinds of data. I think one way is to look at it this way. You have a square peg, which is new technology. And then you've got a small circle, which is decades old law. And the technology for Fourth Amendment protections, which the law is trying to do, you're trying to fit it in there, but it doesn't fit in there. But this bill is an attempt to open up the circle a little bit so that the square peg of technology can go in there. Now, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, a lot of the language that you see here in this bill is already law in statute. The 90 days, the adverse result. We even you know, talk about the Kelsey Smith law that was in here. That's one of the exceptions that was talked about by, by the Senate. Now the issue and the crux of this bill is basically whether you as legislators and policymakers are going to believe that when law enforcement gets historical data, or does contemporaneous surveillance of you using some of the things that we've heard about in the news or other kinds of things named after fishes? That's the choice before you. It's now done with a very low threshold of what you might say that are relevant and material to ongoing criminal investigations, relevant to a legitimate law enforcement inquiry. And that's based on the intertwinement of 626A28, which your council control or also the, the, the federal uh, Title 18. So it's a combination of both. Now, there might be some confusion in whether or not this is brought up, but there is what is also known as the electronic device that they put on your car, that they put on your uh, container, and basically the Supreme Court in the Jones case have said that you need a basically search warrant probable cause. That is a whole different thing. What we're dealing here is just with data that is collected for, at, for location data. So I think that you as a committee have to decide whether or not when folks get after this data, is it an unreasonable search? Does it violate a reasonable expectation of privacy? I'm going to say the trend is yes. Wisconsin you know, just recently was dealing with the law in other states too. So, Mr. Chairman, the thing is that what's going to happen in law enforcement is going to argue that there's really no need for a search warrant. And even as we have gone in this process from the House side and now on the Senate side, they do not believe that should be mentioned. And so that's the issue that you have to decide. That is it a search or is it a reasonable a breach of a reasonable expectation of privacy? I do believe. And I believe it's important that a Fourth Amendment guarantees active judicial supervision. Now, my I just said this with, with you and just as a statement is the legislature is well suited to understand the changing public attitudes to draw all the boundaries and balance the privacy. Um, that's pretty much up to you. I tried to do just a high kind of thing, but I can tell you a lot of details if any of you are, are interested or if you have any questions. Okay, any questions for Mr. Williams? Thank you. Uh, 
Chris Hanna. to this data that is being collected could use this for the various purposes. Especially considering the fact that county sheriffs are candidates themselves for office, and also that there are non-elected officials that have access to this technology. Uh, simply, there ought to be a separate branch of government that oversees uh, the ability to use GPS location-related data. And by limiting this to uh, reasonable searches and warrants, we actually will create a safer and more secure Minnesota. And I'm open for questions. Thank you, Mr. Hanna. Any questions for Mr. Hanna? Thank you for your testimony. I appreciate it. Uh, Dan Fife. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, my name is Dan Fite, and I'm just uh, testifying as an individual here. Um, I've had a, an interest in what law enforcement does with technology ever since the 2008 Republican National Convention. I think there are unanswered questions about what kind of law enforcement technology was used at the RNC in 2008, or could be used in the future in similar events. So, um, to illustrate kind of, I think, some level of what's happening, um, I can compare it to a personal experience I had. In my high school, uh, students and administrators had laptops with wireless capability, and uh, so some of us discovered there was a program called Etherbeak where we could grab all of the wireless data and then filter it to collect people's email addresses, passwords, websites they were visiting, their instant messages. And so um, I disclosed that this was happening, that this could happen, that this was a concern, and uh, made sure that everybody knew that this was what was going on with the technology. And so right now I think law enforcement is doing similar things with cell phones. Uh, we don't know how many times they're using uh, what are called CDMA interrogators, that is to say devices that pretend to be a cell phone tower, because when those devices are activated, which may violate the FCC rules against device interference, um, devices will provide their ID, their serial numbers, to these devices, the law enforcement devices. 
And so I think it's uh, only fair that law enforcement responsibly disclose what they really do with cell phones. I think that's totally a reasonable thing to expect of them. And I think that with this bill, we have a good reform that re requires a second branch of government to check just what law enforcement is doing. It brings in the third branch of government, the legislative branch, to review this at regular periods, get a good sense of what the patterns of activity are. I think that it's a good practice to require notice to be provided to people that are targeted, because people need to understand when their privacy gets reduced through technical means, through law enforcement's intervention in their lives. And I think that it's vitally important to require warrants specifically. I think that um, laws need to advance with uh, technology, with the times. I think it's too easy right now for administrative subpoenas to be used repeatedly to collect potentially dozens of times per day someone's location without uh, any you know, external checks from another branch of government. Um, I think that uh, there needs to be a standard. When technology is kind of subverted from its intended consumer function and your privacy gets reduced, at least two branches should be involved in that when people lose their privacy. As more data piles up, um, this expands the capabilities for what's called retroactive surveillance. So that if, say, it's reported that someone's at a particular location, like a bar, on May 1st, and then on May 15th, um, law enforcement finds somebody else that they're interested in, they can sort of rewind previous data to try to figure out who was in that location on May 1st. So all of this technology makes it easier and easier for law enforcement to peer back into our personal activities in the past with incredible granularity. And I think that that kind of thing needs to be regulated carefully. I think that's very important and that uh, cell phone tower monitoring as well as using data apps um, are two <coughs> that um, are relevant to this. Um, so I also want to add that I think that um, the news that there are devices like the Harris Kingfish system or administrative subpoenas for location data um, has an important uh, chilling effect on political activity. I think that's very central to this. I think a lot of people are disinclined to go to protests if they feel like their cell phone location data will be thrown in a database. I um, saw that this actually occurred in the Ukraine um, recently within the last few months. People got text messages for being near a demonstration and similar methods could be used domestically unless we have uh, you know, appropriate checks on that kind of technology. So um, also, I finally, I just want to add that um, when uh, devices that could determine cell phone data, like the Harris Kingfish, were approved in Hennepin County. There were assurances made that we as citizens would be able to review the administrative policies that were developed for the use of the things like the Kingfish cell phone interception device. And those policies have not been released. Um, when, under Minnesota Data Practices Act, we asked for policies about the Kingfish device. Those have been turned down under the security exemption. And so I think that's why it's very important for the legislature to um, to build a system with better accountability so that we can more precisely understand what, how these things are working because law enforcement has not released that type of administrative data. So that's kind of the main things I have to say and uh, thank you for your patience at this late hour. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony, for sticking around and testifying. Absolutely, I care deeply about this. Uh, any questions for Mr. Fike? Senator Deason. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, um, and thank you, Mr. Pike. So, when you were going through and finding that, um, you know, some of your friends and others that you could access everything through the internet, uh, through laptops and everything. So, this sounds talking law enforcement. I'm going to be ignorant here. Do we have any, any laws on the books right now that can keep other people from doing it? I've heard, um, I have a bad recollection of hearing that. Um, people can attach something to, anybody can attach something to your cell phone and then track where you're going. Um, and parents can do that for kids. And so what? is there anything that can, you know, I can think of stalking? Um, right. Um, get into that. that absolutely, but, Senator Members, that's an excellent question. I think that we all have to work as a society together on understanding what the vulnerabilities of technical systems are. And the way that these policies have been handled, whether it's the NSA stuff at the federal level or cell phone interrogators at the state level, um, I think that law enforcement has not been forthcoming about what the levels of vulnerabilities are. Devices like the Kingfish are going to become cheaper and more commercialized so that 
crazy kids could get their own sort of Russian or Chinese knockoff version of the kingfish, probably within about two years, I would estimate. And so the same type of vulnerabilities that kingfish type systems exploit to collect location data will also be exploitable by cheaper consumer devices within a short period of time. And that's why we need to kind of compel law enforcement through statute to be more honest about the technical vulnerabilities that they're exploiting to collect location data. Basically, law enforcement has the, the Cadillac of these devices, but the, uh, the Yugo or the Geo Metro of similar devices are coming up soon, and so we need to get law enforcement to talk honestly about how those devices work in order to start developing more secure devices for our whole society. So um, I think that cell phones are quite insecure, and there's just a number of different vulnerabilities, and I think that um, we'll be in a better state in terms of economic security, privacy, everything, if we can all just sort of be more honest about how these things work in a responsible way. But there are many, many vulnerabilities, and I think we all got to look more carefully at that and then push for responsible disclosure from all sectors of the government. Thank you, Mr. Chair, but it's not just the government. I mean, yeah. you can hang up, you know, an ex-boyfriend along and track you or something. So it's not just the government that is potentially doing this. It's you know, your neighbor. Yeah, absolutely. And they have a graphic. Just uh, didn't mean to uh, Senator, members, um, I, I think that's just exactly why we need to help, um, you know, develop tools and have responsible disclosures so that um, vulnerabilities are addressed and they're known and what we call it in software development version patches come out that can resolve these uh, security holes. I think it'd be great if the state of Minnesota would release a device that could scan your apps to see if they have obvious security holes. So we can we can do a lot to reform this and basically um, make everybody's communications technology more secure. But also, too, I think with bills like this, we can reduce the chilling effects and reduce a lot of the problems that technology creates when it can potentially really cut down on our civil liberties. Mr. Chair, Senator so, Peterson. If I could just respond to that, I think there's a very important distinction between the activities of private individuals and, and the force of government. Um, uh, government has the ability to take away your liberty, to take away your life, even, um, and government operates within the confines of the authority that has been granted to them, and that authority is somewhat enumerated, and also rights of the citizens are enumerated in this case in the Fourth Amendment. So I think there is an important distinction between what some private individual may or may not be able to do with their own technology and what the government has the ability to do. I think the consequences are much more significant when government is the actor. Senator Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, the Senator uh, Peterson echoed the sentiments that I was going to say as well. That, that, that there is a difference between a private citizen and, 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 and police. And so, thank you. That's all I can say. All right. So, you've raised some issues that are much broader than the bill before us. And, yeah. and uh, it's helpful to, to consider that but then we ask, as, as we move in the late hours, we try to concentrate now on the, the specifics of the bill before us. So. Um, we have, uh, thank you, Mr. Fike. Thank you. Um, uh, Chief David Cole has signed up to testify. Chief Cole. <coughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is 